Hello, and welcome to From the Woods Today. I'm your host, Billy Thomas. I'm an extension forester at the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And today, um, Renee Williams is not with us as she's actually on a well-deserved vacation. So I um, hope she's having a great time. But we do have a great show for you today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom, you can use the chat pod and we can interact with you there. And if you're watching on Facebook, please use the comment section and we will respond as quickly as possible. So today's show is really jam-packed. We've got Dr. Ellen Crocker. She's going to be talking about what's bugging or what's causing problems with our oak trees here. This time of year, we get lots of questions about oak trees and what's going on with them. And then she's going to be followed by Dr. Matt Springer. Matt's going to be talking about a new bird illness that's been appearing and it's actually showing up in northern Kentucky already. Um, pretty concerning. Um, Matt will give us what we know about that. He'll also mention there's a turkey uh, um, survey that's going on. Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources is currently conducting conducting a turkey survey across Kentucky. We'll tell you a little bit about that. And then we're going to have Laurie Thomas with the ever popular Tree of the Week. And Laurie will be in with us um, on camera and in the studio talking a little bit more about this really cool tree. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring up our first guest. I'm Dr. Ellen Crocker. Hey, Ellen, how are you? Hey there, I'm doing great. How's it going, Billy? It's going good. I'm glad to have you here with us. And, um, you know, I was mentioning we get a lot of questions this time of year about oak trees and what's going on with them. So it's a very timely topic that you've got for us. Definitely. And so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, kind of what's wrong with my oak. So all of those questions that you might have or that you might get about what's going on with my oak. And, um, you know, as with any tree issue, I'm going to try to bend it into a few different categories, which is, I think, really important for people to be thinking about is kind of the things that can kill healthy trees. So the really serious issues that you want to watch out for because those could kill your healthy trees, um, things that can stress trees or that could kill stressed trees. Um, while these can be problems, there's also a lot you can be doing to promote the health of your tree so that they're not a problem in the future. And then another category, which is I think really important when we're talking about oak issues this time of year, things that look bad but aren't really a problem. And all of these could happen on your oaks, um, but hopefully today we can distinguish a few of those. We can talk about some of the common uh, things that you might be seeing, uh, both those that might look terrible, but not something that's really gonna hurt your tree, as well as the more kind of serious issues. So the first thing I wanna talk about is something that kind of touches on all of these, and that's oak decline in general. So oak decline is just a general term for stress over time leading to decline in death in trees. And you can see it in a lot of different contexts, but if you think about your uh, woods and just kind of trees that are getting older, that are declining and dying over time. So those little stresses adding up. And oak decline is kind of a blanket term for lots of many different factors adding up over time leading to the death of those trees. Um, red oaks are most susceptible to oak decline. Um, and if you think of something like a black oak, that's a pretty short lived species to begin with, uh, you'd be most likely to see that. In some ways, oak decline is kind of like your trees are getting old and they're getting susceptible to a lot of different insects and diseases that maybe a healthy, vigorously growing tree would be able to defend itself against. Um, but if that tree is stressed and it's not able to do that, you can have a lot of those kind of opportunistic issues coming in and causing problems. There's maybe not one thing that you could treat or address that's going to help that tree, um, but trees that are doing well will be less susceptible to that. Now, there are some site kind of issues. And if you're on sites that are, are really conducive to this with those older red oaks, you're likely to see those trees decline a little bit earlier than you might expect. Um, but uh, oak declines is kind of blanket term for, you know, oaks declining and oaks dying, but it's not caused by any one thing. So let's talk about some of the common things, uh, especially in your woodlands that might kind of contribute to that oak decline because a lot of times when people think about oak decline what they're really thinking about 
are kind of uh, the factors that predispose those trees to stress. You know, was there anything like a big drought, which we've certainly had, or in some areas you might get a lot of defoliating insects that could stress trees. Um, uh, and if you have those old trees, you know, that's kind of set the stage for opportunistic issues coming in later that can be a problem. And some of those opportunistic issues might be things like root rots, right? There are lots of different root rots that are out there. And if you've got um, stressed older trees, they could be a problem. Um, you know, this is a photo of a honey mushroom, and you're probably not going to see this most of the time. What you might see is this thinning canopy, things not kind of leaves not being as um, uh, flushed out, um, dying back of branches one by one. Um, but if it's a root rot issue, what's causing that is going to be below ground, it's going to be in the roots. Um, so occasionally you might see some mushrooms pop up. Uh, but what you're more likely to see, because this is going to just happen during a really brief window, come and go, um, is maybe the evidence of this down, down the road of trees that have tipped over. Um, you know, they might have decay in at the base, in the trunk. They might have a root system that's clearly compromised, where those roots can't really anchor the tree as well as it, as it could have. Um, and with kind of all of this oak decline in general, you know, management options are limited because the this this root rot, it's not really what stressed the tree to begin with. You have an old tree, and at some point, some decay got in there, um, and so you know anything that promotes the health of the tree is going to be good. And especially if you can do that before trees start to be stressed, when they're still doing well, you know, you promoting that, continuing that. Another really common issue that's associated with oak decline is hypoxylon canker. Um, so you might have seen these kind of gray or black patches on uh, dead, dying trees. This is uh, caused by a fungus, but the thing about hypoxylon canker is that it can act as a pathogen in a tree and it can be a nail on the coffin to a tree that's already declining. But this fungus is in those trees well before it starts to decline, just waiting for the conditions to be right, waiting for that tree to be stressed enough for it to start growing and taking over. So you'll also see this on, you know, dead logs in the wood. It's a natural uh, fungus that's, you know, present throughout our area. Um, and it's not something new that's coming in and attacking your trees as much as something that's taking advantage of those stress conditions and making them worse, of course. Um, but there's not a lot you can do about that other than just promoting the health of your trees. Um, but this is a really common site in those declining trees. And you can see this in your woods. You can also see it in urban settings, um, especially if you've got dead wood up in the canopy, a dead branch here or there. If you see this, it lets you know that that wood is, is dead and uh, is, is, you know, the water in it's really low. Otherwise, the fungus would not be thriving. Um, so another potential issues. And there's lots of other kind of insects and diseases that are associated with oak decline. Things like this two-lined chestnut borer, you can see the signs of that insect there and its kind of characteristic holes. And uh, these are things that can certainly stress trees out, but they're really taking advantage of those stressed trees and those stress conditions. And they're unlikely to be an issue for healthy trees. You know, oak decline is an issue of stressed trees. Um, so not something that if your trees are doing well is going to necessarily move in and cause problems, but can take advantage of those. So that's um, one of the most common issues that I see in woods in our area. And I think a lot of that is being driven by the fact that we just had this, some major droughts recently, as well as the fact that we have trees that are naturally aging into kind of an older class that's gonna be more susceptible, especially those red oaks, um, things like black oak, um, as they mature, their life expectancy is not forever. So there's gonna be many different things um, like the ones we just discussed that take them out. Now, this time of year, though, I get lots of emails about all of the many, many things that are growing on oaks, on oak leaves, um, on oak stems. And in this picture, you can see lots of different galls. Um, galls are a general term for abnormal swellings. These could occur on the leaves. They could occur on the stems, um, you know, all sorts of different places. Oaks host many, many, many different types of galls, hundreds of different species. Um, and each of the ones in this photo is caused by an insect. 
They could be caused by wasps, by flies, um, by different types of insects. Some galls are also caused by fungi, um, but most of those oak galls that you see this time of year are caused by insects. And the good news is that the vast majority of these don't really hurt the tree at all. Um, they have a really minor impact because they're impacting the leaves and really doing limited damage. Those leaves can still photosynthesize, the tree can still get its energy, um, it might have a funny looking pom-pom on it in the case of this uh, little uh, sower gall, um, or an oak apple gall, it might have a big swelling on it, um, but it's not really going to hurt the tree. Um, there are some galls that can be more damaging, and those two tend to be the galls that aren't just kind of on the leaves, but would impact the twigs of the tree itself because those might limit new growth. Things like horned oak gall and gouty oak gall, you might have seen these before, um, these big tumor-like swellings on branches. And so where those are occur, they will kind of cut back on the new shoot growth of oaks. Um, if you just have a few galls in a tree, it's not a big deal. But if your tree is entirely filled with them, it can be more of an issue. Um, these are caused by tiny little wasps. And um, you know, from a management perspective, most of the time it's not really merited. Um, and you can't really do much other than pruning them out. So something you could do on some smaller trees, but certainly not an option um, on larger trees where you have this throughout the canopy. I typically see these in kind of being uh, more of a problem in those urban areas on stressed trees. You'll see it elsewhere, you'll see it in your woods here and there. But when you get a whole canopy filled with it, it tends to be trees that are other, already stressed. So another point in favor of just promoting the health of your trees to begin with, so they have fewer of these issues. And here's a photo of a tree, as I mentioned, kind of in that urban stressful environment that's just filled with these galls. At this point, there's really not a lot you can do to manage that. Um, insecticides aren't gonna be very effective um, because what's happening there is the gall is the product of the insect um, emitting some chemicals inside of the tree that causes it to produce this abnormal growth. So the tissue that's there is actually the, the tree's tissue um, building up, and that's going to also protect that insect from any insecticides that you might try to, to spray. Um, uh, it's not going to be very effective, and you can't really prune this out at this point. Um, so in general, with these galls, not a problem, especially in your woods, but if you've got them in your landscape setting, thinking about preventing them from spreading to new trees, so you might want to get rid of this tree uh, so that it doesn't attack the trees nearby, as well as promoting the health of trees in general. And there are lots and lots of different galls. You know, oaks are powerhouses when it comes to biodiversity and supporting diversity of plants. And sometimes that can look bad. Here's a tree that, you know, just has leaves that look like they're brown and dying. But if you look at those up close, what you'll see is jumping oak gall, tiny, tiny little galls on the underside of those leaves that are caused by little, little bitty wasps. Um, and it really is not going to have a major impact on the health of that tree. It might look bad. It might look like that tree is dying, but if you look up close, you know, the trees can still photosynthesize, they still have plenty of green, um, and uh, that's just another way that oaks are supporting these natural communities. Um, there are lots of other leaf issues out there besides galls. Um, you know, one of the most common ones that I'll see early summer, late spring is anthracnose. And that's caused by a fungus that's creating these dead patches in the leaves. Um, there are many other kind of fungal leaf issues that can impact uh, oak leaves uh, from this uh, oak leaf blister to tobacchia blight. Um, lots of different things that can make those oak leaves look really ratty this time of year. But the good news is that most of these, not a major concern for your tree. When you see these leaf issues uh, like this one, it's just gonna be a fungus that when the conditions are right, is gonna be um, causing some problems on those leaves, but not really impacting the tree overall. Um, especially if those trees are healthy otherwise, they'll bounce right back from it. Um, here's a photo of kind of something 
that you might see and see these leaf issues and think, oh my gosh, all of these trees have died. And this was a report that the Kentucky Division of Forestry received a few ba years back of, you know, all of my oak trees suddenly died. Um, and of course, the, the landowner thought this because you look at those trees, it's the middle of summer and they've all turned brown. But when they looked more closely at the leaves, what they found was that those trees weren't actually dead. Um, there was just something eating the leaves and it was really prolific locally, lots of it. Um, um, and, and you can see some of these leaves, if you looked a little closer, had these little patches taken out. And if you look even closer, you can see that it's got this insect that's eating those leaves. In this case, the shingle oak skeletonizer um, that's just eating all the green tissue and leaving behind that skeleton of the leaf, the hard um, kind of uh, uh, a part that is, is not as easy for it to eat. Um, so that's something that can, you know, look really bad, but it tends to happen in patches. It's not going to happen in the exact same place year after year. And those trees will recover from, they'll bounce back from. So while it might look bad, not a serious stressor for trees overall. And a lot of what we see this time of year is kind of like that. Another one that we see a lot right now is the oak shot hole leaf miner. Um, at different stages, this is caused by a fly that can cause these holes in oak leaves. Um, and it can also the larvae of the fly that it lays, they actually tunnel inside of the leaf and can cause these kind of brown patches. And if you peel them off, you'll actually find that larva. Um, and it can make your oaks look really tattered and um, kind of the, the leaves look bad this time of year, but not a major health issue for those trees. Um, now, I wanna kind of contrast that with something that also looks bad on the leaves, um, but is more serious. So this is something that you might look at and just say, oh, this kind of looks like those other pictures you showed, some brown patches on leaves. This is um, actually caused by a bacterium that's in the vascular system of the tree that's cutting off the flow of water in that tree, which is really essential for that tree. That's not just some leaf spot. That's something that's really stressing that tree. And what you're seeing in those leaves is not that bacteria, but the sign of water stress in that tree um, that lets you know this is something serious. And this is bacterial leaf scorch, which is an issue that can kill healthy trees um, in our area. And you might see leaves like this, especially a little later in the summer when we start to get more water stress. Um, if those trees have bacterial leaf scorch, um, they're not gonna be able to deal with it as well. And you'll see a tree kind of um, declining little by little um, over time, each year looking worse and worse. So while bacterial leaf scorch can kill trees, this tends to happen over several years. Um, and there's no effective treatment for it, but if you can promote the health of your trees and keep them healthy, you can give them more life um, and prolong kind of uh, how well they can deal with bacterial leaf scorch. And bacterial leaf scorch is a really common issue in our urban areas. But again, we don't really see it in our woodlands. And I think part of that is that our trees are less stressed, you know, urban environments inherently more stressful, um, but also there's gonna be less transmission of this bacterium from tree to tree in our diverse uh, wooded areas. So um, this is a kind of major stressor in urban areas, um, not as big of an issue in our um, wood areas. And there are lots of other, you know, things that can damage trees, both in our woods and in urban areas that can impact oak trees. So whether it's, you know, a fire scar that you might see at the base of an oak that shows you that, um, you know, years ago when there was a fire, it damaged the base of the tree and fungus got in there and caused decay to that trunk. Um, that probably that tree is going to live for a long time and put on new growth. Uh, it will really decrease the value of that wood because it's rotted um, to damage that's caused by everything from logging equipment to wildlife that can be a perfect entry point for more uh, decay fungi in the future. And then in urban areas, we see this too. If you damage trees, um, it's a perfect entry point for decay fungi. So whether it's something like 
topping a tree here, which is a poor pruning practice, can really hurt trees, um, impact their growth long term, um, to something as simple as damage from string trimmers at the base of the tree. This is really common in urban areas. And you know, doing this once might not really hurt your tree. Trees are resilient. Um, but if this is happening over and over again, that's a perfect entry point for decay fungi that can get in and cause problems down the road. And of course, there are lots of other common landscape issues for any tree, um, but uh, oaks in particular, things like uh, trees planted on the wrong site where there's no rooting space, say in this median right here, uh, trees that were planted poorly to begin with, maybe they were planted too deep. Um, so that their roots were suffocating. Uh, over mulching, like in this picture, this is a volcano of mulch, a mountain of mulch that's not going to give those roots with the kind of air they need to breathe. It's also piling it right up against the tree trunk and you can see the decay starting there. Um, all sorts of different things that can impact any urban tree, uh, oaks included. Um, so one thing I do want to mention is I've mentioned all these things that might go wrong with oaks, but we have a few things that aren't a problem in Kentucky yet that sometimes I get emails about. And so I just wanted to put in a, a little note about these. We don't have sudden oak death, which is a pathogen that can rapidly kill um, oaks. It's an invasive issue. We don't want to get it. Um, I don't want to know what will happen when it gets introduced. Um, but so far, we have not had any reports of um, sudden oak death, um, which will cause these cankers in trees that will cut off their circulation. Um, we don't really have oak wilt in our state, which is another uh, kind of issue, a fungal issue that can get in the vascular system and cut off uh, the circulation of those trees, kind of in some similar ways to what we talked about with bacterial leaf scorch, um, and rapidly kill oak trees. Um, not a major issue in Kentucky, although it certainly can be in other areas. And we don't yet have gypsy moth, which is an invasive insect that the caterpillars of them will totally defoliate oaks. Um, and you can read reports this time of year of other places that have this invasive uh, caterpillar where you know all of the leaves on the trees have been eaten. Um, and you'll walk through the woods and you know it's totally, you know, feels like spring or something with no leaves this time of year. That can really stress those trees when it happens year after year after year. And we'd like to prevent gypsy moth from arriving as long as possible uh, to promote the health of our oak trees. So while I mentioned a lot of, you know, um, potential bad things that are happening to oaks, um, a positive that we don't yet have these, but also a reminder to kind of keep a lookout for anything new that might be impacting our trees. So to recap, so the things that I talked about that can kill healthy trees, I mentioned the sudden oak death and oak wilt and gypsy moth. Well, fortunately, we don't have them right now, but we need to be on the lookout for those and prevent their arrival. Um, so, so always, if there's something new that's happening, uh, look out for it and so you can stop it before it spreads. Uh, I mentioned bacterial leaf scorch that vascular disease, that's especially a problem in urban areas. And with that, you wanna be very careful um, if you have it, not to prune um, an infected tree and then a healthy tree because it can spread in the vascular system and could spread that way. Um, poor management and damage is another one. So just doing everything you can to promote the health of trees. And then we talked about things that can stress trees and can kill stress trees. We talked about oak decline in general, um, that kind of decline of oaks as they age that's associated with lots of different stressors, um, root rots, hypoxylin canker, two-line chestnut borer. And then we talked about things that look bad but aren't really a problem. And fortunately, that's most of what we see, especially this time of year. All of those different leaf damages and galls um, that might look terrible but really aren't hurting the tree and I think are just an indication of how important oaks are in our um, ecosystems and how important diversity is uh, because they, they're supporting this huge diversity of different insects. So the good news with oak issues is that 
most of what we have are these kind of more minor things. And for the other things, your management can have a big role. So if you're promoting the health of your trees overall when it comes to oak, um, if you're doing other things that will promote oak in your area, insects and diseases are not likely to really um, drive things uh, in Kentucky right now. So with that, I want to wrap it up. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And, you know, as always with uh, tree issues, I really recommend uh, reaching out to professionals um, in your woodlands, reaching out to a forester if you've got questions about the health of your oaks or other trees. And in our landscape trees, uh, reach out to an arborist, a professional who can help you not only assess what's going on, but actually better manage your trees and promote their health. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, see what questions we have. Ellen, good presentation. Really appreciate that. I, you know, there's so much that impacts our oaks. I mean, you just gave us, you covered a lot, of, a lot of ground with that right there. The good news was many of those did not seem to be like a major threat. Um, so that's, that's encouraging. You know, one of the questions I have as we're waiting for some others to get a question in is, you know, when should somebody kind of seek that assistance? You know, I mean, what, what's that threshold? Or is it something brand new? Or do you need a certain percentage of the tree to be impacted? Or you got any thoughts um, related to that? I think that's a really good point. And I think that's, um, you know, trying to, to look carefully at what you're seeing to try to distinguish those things that are, you know, they might look bad, but they're not really going to hurt your tree from those things that, that do have the potential to hurt your tree is important because, you know, you don't really need to call a professional for um, a lot of those leaf issues. Let's say you have um, anthracnose or some, some minor galls on your tree. That's, you don't need to do anything about those. <laughs> you can, you can try to learn to love them. Them. You can try to, to prune them out for those goals, but not a major issue. Um, and I'd say just, just learning to watch your trees over time to see what's happening is good and try to identify what that is. Um, but one thing I'd also say is that if you're noticing your tree is dying back, like let's say that the tips of your tree, um, you see dead tips um, in those landscape trees, or you see kind of an increasing number of branches dying over time, to me that's a red flag of, huh, I wonder what's going on there that's hurting the health of your tree. It, it might have nothing to do with the symptoms you see in the leaves. It might have to do with the site or some construction that recently happened or how the tree was planted, you know, 25 years ago. Um, but getting to the root of that problem will help you figure out how to promote the health of those trees um, overall. That's a good point. And, you know, and I'm thinking about when you get these pictures or these images, I mean, you're really kind of almost like doing an autopsy, trying to figure out what's going on, kind of what, what's causing that real issue, what's driving that. And it's interesting that there's so many secondary things that come in, and that may be what people notice, but there really might have been something else. Um, that was I see we've got a comment about um, someone's uh, Schumard oak has stunted curls, misshapen leaves. Um, but they're dark green. And I'd say like, that's a really good question. That's really common of the types of questions I get is that like something doesn't look quite right. Um, and I think uh, that's the first step is, is identifying, you know, what's normal, and then you've got something that's different from normal. And of course, there's lots of variation in trees. So sometimes that's just how that tree is. Um, but sometimes something's wrong. And it could be an insect, it could be a disease, it could be the site, it could be, you know, maybe it, you sprayed some herbicide nearby, and it had some drift from that. There's lots of different potential issues. So for anybody who's watching that's wondering, huh, I wonder what's going on with my tree. Um, I recommend taking some good photos of that and um, talking with your county extension agent because they can look at those, see if other people have seen similar things in their area. Uh, we also have, you know, a plant diagnostic lab with the University of Kentucky um, that if, if, you know, nobody's familiar with this problem, they can actually send in a sample to and try to, you know, figure out what's going on there. Yeah. Good points. Very good. And, and for those watching, if you've got um, uh, photos uh, that you want to send, make sure you, you send several um, of the whole tree in its contacts, kind of what's going on. So people can see the site, can see, you know, what's happening at the base of the tree, what's happening around it, as well as those individual leaves or whatever the problem might be. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Those digital photos are easy to share and we can get a lot of eyes on them pretty quickly. So um, that's a great point. Yeah. Connect with your county extension agents. They're a great resource for sure. Exactly. And, you know, you know, Ellen, I guess I'd say the takeaway is, you know, keep those trees healthy, right? You know, the, the oh, yeah. healthier they are, the more vigorous they are, the more resilient they're going to be against some of these threats. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, we are lucky here because we have, you know, the ability to grow fantastic oak trees. <laughs> we don't currently have the invasive issues that are impacting them like in other places. We have a great diversity of oak trees. And so the things that you can do to promote their health, um, you know, that's that's the best thing to, to protect them long term. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. We did get one note from one of our county extension agent viewers, and um, she indicated that the plant diagnostic lab, they really want the county agents to kind of be the ones submitting those samples. So um, we can get some control of that. So yeah. So and your county agent is always the best first um, first kind of person to reach out to on your tree health issues, because they can look at those samples. They can say, oh, you know, somebody brought this in last week. <laughs> it's, it's happening everywhere. In I've already area. sent that in. And, yes. And if they really don't know, then they'll reach out to the plant diagnostic lab and and um, bring in that expertise as well. Excellent. All right. Ellen, thanks again. Appreciate all you do. Bring in some great knowledge and information to all our viewers here. Thank you. Thanks for having me on today. All right. All right. So we're going to keep the show going now. And um, we have a, a new issue that's popped up. And it is concerning, especially if you're a birder or you care about birds. We've got Dr. Matt Springer with us. I'm coming from Wolf Creek Hatchery, a fish hatchery, is it? Yeah, we're uh, doing some family camping this week, but um, this bird issue has popped up and uh, has, you know, several folks, uh, county agents especially, have been fielding a lot of questions. So I wanted to try to give an update uh, for what little we actually do know about this issue, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so just to kind of... Um, give you a little bit of summary of what's going on here. And, and basically uh, a few months ago, um, Washington DC, Baltimore, Maryland area, there was a bunch of birds that were uh, being found um, with uh, some interesting symptoms that do not line up with any um, illnesses uh, that we are currently aware of in birds. Um, and a lot of these birds were being found uh, not really in rural areas, but much more in the urban environment. Uh, and close to houses and feeders. Um, at that point in time, they collected a lot of these uh, birds that were found dead and submitted samples uh, to wildlife disease laboratories uh, in hopes of determining um, what was causing this mass mortality event. And um, interestingly enough, uh, no, no known diseases were identified at this time to be the causative agent uh, for this issue. Um, now, fast forward a couple months and, um, you know, many of the wildlife uh, managing agencies were on alert for looking for these um, issues within their state. And we have now added six states to the list of uh, areas uh, where positives of this disease have been found, including Kentucky as of uh, about three weeks ago. Um, initially, uh, birds in uh, Boone, Kenton, and Jefferson County were identified as positives as of a couple days ago. We have now added uh, Bullitt, Campbell, and Madison counties to this list. So we have six out of 120 counties have known positives uh, for this disease. And it's only so far has been identified in Robins, Blue Jays, Starlings, and Common Grackles. And the symptoms that we're seeing are swelling around the eyes, uh, a crusty discharge around the eyes um, or neurological symptoms uh, that cause the birds to act um, very peculiar. Uh, they, they won't be able to fly or they'll fly in, in weird patterns. Uh, they, they may act just odd. Um, and you know, those are pretty much the causes or the symptoms that we're seeing uh, that are being caused by this disease. Uh, as you can see in this blue jay, you know, that, that crusty eye look, that swelling around the eye is pretty evident. Uh, this is a, a definite, you know, these birds were positive for the disease. So um, unfortunately, because we know so little about this, um, we really don't have much we can tell you. Uh, I can't even tell you what the name of the disease is yet. Um, what we do know is it seems to um, potentially be spreading uh, or we're identifying more areas that already have it. 
uh, on, you know, with how folks monitor their bird feeders and, and care for birds, um, we believe this is a new disease that, that has popped up this year uh, because the, these kind of events have been, you know, the, the rate at, that they're being identified across, you know, the, the mid, um, mid Atlantic coast area now into our, you know, Ohio, Kentucky uh, is pretty high. So we think that um, this is probably a relatively new disease. If you think that you have birds in your area that are potentially exhibiting symptoms, um, Fish and Wildlife uh, has a website uh, that you can go to, and I'm going to put the, the link uh, in the chat here, um, where they are asking you to report uh, that incident to them. Um, and they'll have you fill out, you know, uh, basically a survey of what's going on, and they'll contact you if needed. Um, because right now they're just trying to figure out how far this disease is spread throughout the Commonwealth. One of the things they are asking um, voluntarily uh, right now is that in any of the counties, those six counties that we do have positives, they want you to take those bird feeders down because um, just like we have experienced in our own lives here in the last 18 months, uh, we're trying to socially distance birds as best as possible because we don't know how uh, this disease really spreads yet. Um, we think there's a possibility it's probably through contact of some sort, whether it's uh, direct contact between birds uh, or indirect contact at things like bird bass, bird feeders. Um, we want to try to eliminate what we can in terms of lowering contact rates among birds. So bird feeders and bird bass are a great way of trying to limit that access. Uh, so if you're in those positive counties, one of those six positive counties, please take those feeders down. That's all feeders, not just you know the 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 seed feed. That's uh, your soot, your your hummingbird feeders, your, any anything you have that congregates birds in an area. We want to eliminate those locations. Um, the good thing is that it is summer, and birds really do not need. Uh, access to that food at a feeder. There's a lot of resources that are naturally occurring right now that there's plenty of food out there for them to get uh, and stay healthy. Uh, so there won't really be a, a impact on the birds themselves because you're removing these feeders. We're just trying to, to, to hopefully lessen the impact of this disease on the bird populations. If you have a bird that has died um, in your area, you want to remove that bird from the landscape uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and make sure that you're handling them with gloves and put them in a plastic bag and try to dispose of them in an outdoor uh, garbage receptacle that, so that you're not bringing them inside your house. Try to keep your pets away from the birds um, as best you can. You know, obviously we don't like having outdoor cats because they, they are already a problem for birds, uh, but we don't want to potentially um, have uh, domestic animals interact with this bird disease. There has been no issues with this disease with humans or any other domestic animals or other wildlife that we know of at this time. Um, the one last thing that we wanted to do, um, even if you are gonna keep feeding, is to clean those feeders as soon as possible and then clean them once a week with a 10% bleach solution um, and continue that until further, further notice uh, as we learn uh, what's going on with this disease. Also, you wanna try to keep a, and be aware of what um, counties are positive and um, try to deal with that as best we can as we move forward and, and get guidance from Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Now that's a very concerning, Matt, it really is. Um, and hopefully we can get some answers um, quick on what's going on with this. But yeah. so there was a question, um, as a precaution, should we take down feeders in adjacent counties like Fayette? Well, that's kind of a personal um, decision, obviously. Right now, Fish and Wildlife is not recommending all feeders to come down. Uh, I would say in, you know, precaution wise, um, if you are, you know, having the bird's best interest at heart, I would say it, it can't hurt to take the feeders down, especially because we know there's ample food in, in the environment. Um, at the very least, you, you should be cleaning the feeders even in those adjacent counties and, and especially be on the lookout for sick birds uh, the closer you are to where those positive counties uh, are in the, in the state. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to keep you on that as we get more and more information about this. Certainly a big deal um, and very concerning. Any other questions for Matt on this? I was going to say, uh, Matt, I did have a question. When do they think they're going to be able to identify what this is? I mean, do they, as I know in the from Fish and Wildlife and the Herald Leader, 
it, they weren't the veterinarian was like eh, you know it takes a while to process all of this but i didn't know if we had some kind of well so put it in context uh, so dr casey kind of gave an update and has been giving updates on a whole, around a, about a weekly basis and dr kate christine casey is our um, wildlife vet for the Kentucky department of fish and wildlife resources um to put it in context for answers, uh, it's been several months since the initial pathogen samples were sent in and we still do not have an answer. Um, so it it's uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have a timeline on when the, the identification uh, may occur. All I know is there's been plenty of samples submitted and they're working on it. Uh, unfortunately, that's the, the most we know at this time. And I see uh, Mike has submitted a, what, are the, what is the normal ranges of these birds during the summer? Uh, well, so usually um, they're, I'm, and I'm guessing you mean home ranges, Mike, uh, they're, they're relatively small um, now, you know, so you're looking at um, blue jays are you know, probably a couple acres, you know, maybe a dozen at most. Um, they'll, however, they will um, sometimes move around the landscape, so it's really hard to tell. Uh, it's not, it's obviously not migration season, and some of these birds do migrate. Uh, so we don't know um, what the potential is for them to jump county to county or even state to state. Uh, so it, it's hard to tell, but there is always a potential that they, you know, they are animals with the ability to fly several hundred miles in one night on a front. Uh, so it's really hard to tell what, what could, you know, their ranges uh, may be during, you know, this time of year or more in the future. Yeah, so certainly, folks, follow that link that Matt shared. If you have any of these sightings, you know, I think the more we stay on top of this, the better off we'll all be in it, for sure. All right, so if you got any other questions about that, go ahead and drop them in the chat pod. But, Matt, let's switch gears real quick. We're going to stay with the birds. We are. Uh, but we're going to kind of switch to more of a game species, I guess. Yeah, so it, it is, um, you know, it's baby bird season for many, many different species, obviously. Uh, almost all of them, actually. Um and right now, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources is looking for some citizen science efforts uh, from anyone out there that actually runs into and sees turkey pulse. Uh, it's their annual survey time for turkeys. Uh, and, and Zach Danks, the, the turkey biologist for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, is uh, as of July 1st and through the end of August is trying to get as many um, reports of turkeys and turkey poults as he possibly can to help monitor their uh, numbers. Uh, and Billy has pulled up the website that they have to report turkeys uh, to uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, there's a, a simple um, paper data sheet that you can use. There's also a web page that allows you to enter um, data or they have now come out with a phone app uh, to allow you to do it. And it's simple. It's really simple. All you're, they're asking you to do is, if you see a turkey, a hen turkey, uh, then um, look to see if that hen has poults with it. And if you can count how many hens and how many poults there are, that's the information they're looking for. Because they use this info information to determine uh, nesting success and future population uh, growth or decline uh, as we move forward over long term. Um, so this is really helping them gather um, information on how the population may um, be either uh, increasing or decreasing uh, in the next year or two. Uh, it's pretty straightforward and simple and, and really is um, very helpful to Zach and, and the department's uh, monitoring of turkey populations. You know, Matt, I was wondering, you know, uh, there's a lot of bird watchers out there and, and people that love birding and they a lot I hear a lot about this e-bird um, so I'm wondering you know does Fish and Wildlife use any of that information or does it supplement any other information as far as these surveys go? Well so um, Fish and Wildlife definitely um, coordinates and collaborates with uh, Cornell and e-bird. Uh, unfortunately with e-bird for things like um, this data that it's not collecting down to uh, sex or uh, age of the turkeys. So they actually need a little bit more detailed information uh, for, for this specific um, survey. Uh, eBird in general though is incredibly helpful when you start talking about our non-game species, our, our, our um, neotropical migrants, our, our warblers, our vireos, those kind of things. Uh, grassland birds, incredibly helpful for help for, for fish and wildlife to manage them and, and, you know, really encourage uh, folks that have an interest in birding to use that resource. Um, and, and it does 
substantially help us in managing um, many, many of our uh, bird species across the, the world. Well, I just want to make sure that people didn't think if they were using eBird that they didn't need to use this as well. So, um, yeah. So use them both. Um, yeah. <laughs> Please help us out. Right. It, it takes all of us working together for sure. So, um, yes, Matt, thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing this information and um, we'll look forward to future updates on what's going on with these birds and all things wildlife um, here in Kentucky. So thank you so much for being with us today. No problem, Billy. Thank you. Uh, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Um, we did get a question, it looks like, that came in. Um, if I see a turkey brood on my farm and I turn in the info to the survey, then a week later I see another brood in the same area, should I send it in again? I don't know if it's the same brood or not. So, uh, Tom, there are directions in the survey that help, help with that um, and, and that exact question because that's a very common one. Uh, and I believe to, to get a short answer is yes. Uh, and um, the long answer is there's a couple of things um, internally that uh, the biologist will do to help sort through that issue. Uh, however, uh, they can't sort through it and, and let the math figure it out without you submitting it. So um, I'm sure they would, they'll take every survey uh, you can give them if you're seeing turkeys. Yeah, great point. All right. Well, folks, thank you for the questions on that. And Matt, again, thank you for the great information and knowledge and um, get back to the camping trip. Um, all right. So we're going to keep the show rolling. We're going to switch gears from birds and we're going to bring on our resident um, tree of the week expert, Laurie Thomas. And Laurie's got a really cool tree that she's going to be talking about today. Hey, Laurie, how are you? Hey. Hi, good to see you again. It's been a little while. Yes. Um, but yeah, we've got a nice tree and it's it's probably just about finished flowering, but you might have noticed it definitely through June. It's our sourwood, one of my favorite trees. It's got such a great flower um, and wonderful fall color. It's a tree that's great year round anyway, um, but I won't say any more because a lot of it's in here. So um, here we have the sourwood. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the sourwood. Sourwood, Oxydendrum arboreum, is a member of the Ericaceae or Heath family. It is the only species in the Oxydendrum genus. It is also known as sorrel tree or lily of the valley tree. Sourwood is a small to medium sized tree that grows 40 to 60 feet tall and about 8 to 15 inches in diameter. It reaches its largest size on the western slopes of the Smoky Mountains. Sourwood develops a slender trunk and a small crown in dense stands. In more open situations, it forms a short, often leaning trunk dividing into several stout ascending limbs. It is a beautiful landscape tree and the flowers are an important source for honey production. Sourwood is native to the upland forest of the southeastern United States. Like most of the Ericaceae, sourwood generally does not grow on soils of limestone origin, but is most commonly found growing in slightly acidic, well-drained soils. It is classified as somewhat shade tolerant. Sourwood is an understory to mid canopy tree in numerous upland forest types that include post, chestnut, black, and white oak, as well as Virginia, shortleaf, and loblolly pine. Sourwood is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are simple in form, lance-shaped about four to seven inches long, and the leaf margins are finely serrated and the underside midrib has small hairs. The leaves are green above and pale below, and fall color is outstanding, with colors ranging from red to purple to yellow, and these can often be found on the same tree. And the leaves have a sour taste when chewed. Sourwood is monoecious with small white flowers. The flowers are about a fourth of an inch long and they're kind of urn shaped and they're in drooping panicles and the flowers resemble lily of the valley flowers. The panicles of flowers have also been said to resemble a bony witch's hand. It is one of the latest flowering trees with flowering occurring from late June to August. The flowers are insect pollinated, thus an important source for honey production in some areas. The fruit is a very small capsule. The five valved capsules are between one fourth and a half an inch long and they are in those drooping panicles. When the capsules mature, they are dry and they split open and release very tiny two winged seeds. Fruit mature in the fall between September and October and the seeds are gradually dispersed through winter by wind. Sourwood is also capable of vegetative reproduction through stump and root crown sprouting. It is a prolific sprouter. 
The bark is grayish brown. It is very thick and has deep furrows and scaly ridges. The ridges are often broken into identifiable rectangles. The wood of sourwood is hard and close grained. The heartwood is a reddish brown and the sapwood is paler. Sourwood is not a commercially important timber tree, but the wood is used locally for tool handles, fuel, and mixed with other hardwoods for pulp. The wood was once used for wagon sled runners. Sourwood flowers are very attractive to bees, and sourwood honey is common in the south. The honey has a medium to light color with a heavy body, and it's slow to granulate. The flowers are attractive to butterflies and other insects. Natural hollows and older trees provide shelter for climbing reptiles and amphibians, bats, and other small wildlife. Sourwood is one of the species that is host for the fall webworm tents. The caterpillars in the tents attract birds by providing fall invertebrate food. Flowers are quite attractive to bees and the honey is highly sought after. Sourwood is a great specimen tree. It's basically a tree for all seasons. It has lovely abundant flowers that open in midsummer and they curve upward creating a graceful effect at flowering time. There's excellent fall colors, some of the best in the south. The colors range from red to purple to yellow and the hanging panicles of fruit capsules provide winter appeal. The national champion sourwood is in Amelia, Virginia. It's 130 inches in circumference, 74 feet tall, with a 47 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion sourwood is in Bell County at the Cumberland Gap National Park. It's 68 inches in circumference, 66 feet tall, with a 32 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about sourwood. The flower blooms resemble lily of the valley flowers, hence one of its other common names, lily of the valley tree. The name sourwood is derived from the sour, pungent taste of the leaves. The Cherokee and the Catawba used the shoots of sourwood to make arrow shafts. Pioneers used the sap as one ingredient in a concoction used for treating fevers, the bark for chewing to soothe mouth pains, and a leaf tea for treating intestinal discomforts. The scientific genus name Oxydendrum comes from the Greek words oxys and dendron, which mean acid tree, and it refers to the sour taste of the leaves. I'm glad you joined me to learn about the sourwood, and I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the stunning sourwood. Beautiful tree, Laurie. It is. It is. I love it. I know we were able to see it flowering um, when we went to the lake a couple of weeks ago, and it's very, you see it on the roadsides, and it just stands out when heavily in flower. It's a beautiful tree. It's a, it's a nice landscape tree, too, in the right site. It is a tree that is, can be site picky. It likes an acidic soil, but it does well on some of those poor soils. Um, I will say if it's something you're thinking of for your yard, make sure you know what your pH is. You want it a lower pH um, and more like in your five to six pH range. Um, and when you buy them, you do best with a containerized or a B and B type tree, you know, bald and burlapped or containerized seedling. They don't do real well from bare root seedlings. They're a little, a little finicky with that, but they do make a really attractive tree to add to your landscape. So, and yeah. I was going to say, Michael Durr, the the famous um, horticulturalist, he he says it's one of our best native trees, and it rivals even the flowering dogwood. So. Yeah, good point. You know, regarding the soil, we had a question, does it need soil like blueberries? Yep, sure um, does, because right. they're, in, they're in the same family. So yes, that's it yeah. likes that nice acidic soil. And it does, like I said, does well in those kind of poor sites for that. So it yeah. is, it's a lovely tree. I was going to say a general reminder that if you don't know the pH of your soil, there is a great place where you can find that information out. Check in with your local county extension agent. That's one of the many services that they provide. Um, they can run a soil test for you. They can teach you how to do that soil test, give you the analysis and let you know what needs to be done based on what you're trying to grow there. So a great service um, that extension provides. So, Laurie, I love these trees of the week. You do such a great job with them. You've got such a great repository built up of these. So I um, really appreciate you doing it each week for us. Sure. 
And as I always say, I enjoy doing it. It's kind of like reviewing dendrology again from 30 years ago. So it's it's great. And remember these videos, you know, because I record pre-record them so that they are a video and a little smoother than me trying to talk through it on here because I can get a little jumbly, talk too much. Um, those are up on our website on the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources website. And you are more than welcome please use those and share um with with uh, with people in your county excellent all right well laurie thank you again um again i, I want to thank all of our guests today um you know dr ellen crocker did a great job with the oaks and some of the many things that we'll see causing them problems and we learned about this new mysterious illness that's impacting some of our birds which is really concerning um appreciate um dr matt springer sharing that knowledge and information with us and we'll be reaching back to him as we learn more about that we also covered the um, turkey survey that's ongoing with the kentucky department of fish and wildlife resources so please try to help them out um, so they can get a good handle on that population. And then we wrapped up with our tree of the week. So big thanks to all of our guests. Special thanks to all of you all for being with us. We really appreciate it. If you ever have any comments or questions about the show or there's something you want to see, um, please visit us at fromthewoodstay.com. There you can find a little survey link to where you can share um, images or let us know what you've seen or what something you'd like for us to cover. And um, we'll try to get it on a future show. But uh, a big thanks to everyone for being with us today, and we're going to go ahead and sign off, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week at 11 o'clock on From the Woods Today.